to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Apostle Paul said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5. We welcome you today to our study of the selfless mind of Jesus. As we've been looking in this series of lessons on the topic of more about Jesus, today we're thinking about how selfless Jesus was in His mind, in His thinking, in His life, and in His attitude, and how Christians need to also be selfless today. Friend, this is kind of the opposite of the way much of the world is today. Much of the world is selfish. Much of the world is a me first, me and mine first mentality. And if it doesn't profit me and doesn't benefit me, I don't want anything to do with it. Jesus was not that way. And that's really not the way Christians should be either. And so we're glad that you joined us for our study today. Uh, we want to encourage you to get your Bible. If you don't have it already, Find your Bible, locate it, have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by individual members of the Churches of Christ and the Church of Christ congregations in your area. We'd love to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your local area. On Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday for Bible study, why don't you check out the Church of Christ in your area? Look them up, find their address, visit the Lord's Church in your area. You'll, you'll find people there who are friendly and kind, who love other people, who are concerned about lost souls, and who ultimately want men and women to go to heaven. If you've got a Bible question, maybe you've been thinking about salvation. Maybe, maybe you've been thinking, I need to get back in church, or I need to learn more about God and, and the church and worship. Visit the Lord's church. Ask somebody there for a Bible study. They'd be happy to sit down and search the Scriptures together with you. Friend, we'd also like to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. We have a wide variety of good Bible study material. We've got written material, transcripts, study questions, video lessons, audio lessons, all on various topics throughout the Bible, and they're all available from our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Check that out. Fill out a media request form. We'll send the information to you free of charge. Be glad to help you in your study of the Word of God. And if you'd like to know more about God and His truth, please let us know in that way. We also want to encourage you to uh, download for your smartphone the Gospel of Christ app, both on Android and Apple devices. You can get that from the respective Play stores, and that's a great way to study the Word of God on the go as well. We're thinking today about Jesus' character as it relates to His selflessness. And Paul expounds upon the selfless mind of Christ in Philippians chapter 2. And so I want to encourage you to open your Bible to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be looking in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 today. But let me tell you a little bit about the background as to why these people needed to hear about being selfless. Philippi was a city and in some ways a church that had serious problems with selfishness. In fact, in the, Philipp in, in the city of Philippi, people would rather make money off of a woman who was demon-possessed than see her be healed. They were mad when Paul and Barnabas healed that woman even though she was greatly afflicted. That's how they were making her money and they didn't want her healed. That's how selfish some of those people were. It was a city where Roman tradition was more important than the Word of God. Acts chapter 16, verse number 20 following. There were some even in the church that were preaching the gospel for selfish motives. Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 tells us, some were thinking they could do harm to Paul by preaching the same gospel. And Paul said, basically, as long as Christ is preached, I don't care. But how selfish of them to have that mindset. It was a church where 
selfishness was causing big problems with grumbling and complaining. And Paul would say, do all things without murmuring and complaining. In fact, there were even two very selfish women in this congregation. Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. I implore Yodi and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind. They weren't. And their selfishness and dissension was causing problems. And friend, when you think about what's going on here, it's easy to see why Paul addresses this epistle to these people on the subject of selflessness with the greatest example ever, Jesus Christ. And so let's read together what he says in Philippians chapter 2, and we'll actually start beginning in verse number 3. Paul says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery made equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father." As Paul writes, you can hear in verses 3 and 4, don't just look out for your own interests. Don't just think about how this benefits you. Let each esteem others better than himself. Start putting others ahead of yourself at times. There's definitely a problem with selfishness in this congregation. And friend, to make it again very applicable, aren't we sometimes a very selfish society? Don't we think about ourselves way more then we think about how this affects other people. Look, look at the world around us and so many people get upset about the, the, the problems they face and how somebody might have done them wrong or if something just happens bad all of a sudden it's all about, you know, and I understand their problems, but we're so self-centered sometimes that we don't think about how's this affecting others also. Not just my interests, but how does this affect the other interests that people who are involved in this also? And so, how do we counteract selfishness? You counteract selfishness with the selfless mind of Jesus Christ. Paul says, let this mind be in you. What mind? The mind of Jesus. And friend, when you think about a selfless person, you can't find anybody more selfless than Jesus. Jesus was the selfless physician who came on this earth to heal people of their... He was the great doctor who gave his life for his patients, the selfless physician who gave his life for his patients. Mark 2, 17, Jesus said, the righteous have no need of physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Hebrews 2, 14, he through death overcame him at the power of death, that he might release those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Jesus gave his life literally so that other people could escape spiritual death. That, my friends, is the mindset that we're hitting at today. The selfless physician who gave his life for his patients. You know, when I think about Jesus, I, I realize that we're never going to be able to take the sin of others upon ourselves. We can't, we can't do that, but can't I put other people's salvation at times out to the forefront? Everything doesn't have to be about me. You know, when we get a hangnail, we really think that's the worst thing ever. But what about people who are lost in sin still? Sometimes when I take the emphasis off of me, I realize how much need there is for other people. I'm not going to give my life as a sacrifice, but I know a lot of people who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I realize God's Word has the power to save, Romans 1, 16. And so we think about Jesus in His selfless sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9, verse 22, uh, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. And yet Hebrews 10 verse 12 says, This man, 
after he offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And so we're thinking about the epitome of the selfless mind in what Jesus did. Think about this. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 kind of embodies all of it. Paul says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what do you mean I know? Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. Friend, think about where Jesus was. Jesus was in heaven. He left heaven, came to this earth, suffered, bled, and died. Why? So that I could go to heaven. You'll never find anybody more selfless than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so He made the ultimate sacrifice. And you know, my friend, the Bible teaches us. We need to think along the lines of sacrifices we can make to help others as well. Think about this, for example. Is there any way that as I think about others, I can make sacrifices that will help them? Well, I can ultimately sacrifice myself to the cause of God, right? Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul said, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. There's the idea I need every day to be a living sacrifice for the Lord. It's not, life is no longer about me, right? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You are not your own, you're bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which are His. I've been crucified with Christ and I want to take up my cross daily and follow Him. Galatians 2, 20, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And so part of selflessness is I want to sacrifice my life to live for God every day. We can also sacrifice our money. Now friend, please understand what we're saying. We're not here twisting your arm or begging you for money. That's not the idea. We're talking about Christians in the local congregation giving to the cause of Christ so that that congregation can do good and help people who are in need. And that's what the Bible commands. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, we're to give on the first day of the week. Luke 6, 38, give to God, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Well, God will men put back into your bosom. And so we have a command to give. God loves a, a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 7. And, and one of the ways I can sacrifice is by giving to help others who are in need. I can also make sacrifice when I realize that my goal ought to be to try to reach others with the gospel. I can sacrifice my time my ability, my talent to spread the gospel. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. We are to share the message of Jesus, which is a message of hope and love and satisfaction spiritually that you can't begin to imagine. But as you think about this selfless mind, let's delve into that a little further. What exactly did Jesus give up when he came to this earth? Look at Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7 again. Paul says, Of Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery, something to be held on to is the idea, to be robbery, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. What's the selfless mind like? It means you've got to empty yourself. Jesus was in the form of God. He didn't consider it something to be held on to so tightly that he couldn't give that up to come here and be a human and die a death for mankind. He, he didn't consider it something that he couldn't let go of so strongly that he wasn't willing to come here and be a bondservant. Friend, by the term gave up, we don't long, no longer mean that Jesus wasn't God, that he didn't have those privileges and abilities, but that he put them under the directive of the Father. John 5, 19, John 6, 38, John 8, 22, 28, Jesus willingly placed himself under the direction and submission to the Father. He gave up, he gave up equality with God. And he became a human being. Although he was still God and had that power, he took on human form which is so foreign to any idea that we can begin to imagine. And so Jesus completely emptied himself 
of himself, came in the form of a bond servant. He left his heavenly home. Uh, he gave up so many things. He, he, he put everything in, in jeopardy and facing sin and dealing with Satan and dealing with mankind and took a, a weak human body just so I could go to heaven. What does it mean to be selfless? A friend, sometimes you just have to empty yourself. Sometimes the world really makes us want to stick out our chest and pumps us up and, and we hear all the talk and we listen to it and we think, you know, I'm really something, right? Hey, let's empty that a little bit and let's realize who we really are. I'm not saying you don't have value. I'm not saying you aren't important. But friend, I am saying to God, we're no important than anybody else. And when we begin to think we are, we also need to empty ourselves of certain things. Well, what kind of things do I need to sometimes empty myself of? Consider this with me. I need to empty myself of any pride or arrogance in thinking that I'm better than other people. God hates a haughty spirit. Proverbs 6, verses 15 through 17. Pride will always go before destruction. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 5, we don't need leaders who are, think they're the chef, chief shepherd and better than everybody else, but we need leaders who are good servants. We need the attitude that I'm no better than anybody else. I need God's grace and mercy just like everybody else. I'm, a, I'm an unprofitable servant, and without God, I'm nothing. That's what I need to realize. Without God, I'm nothing. I'm no better than anybody else. So many people think they've arrived. They think they're it. They, here's what they think they're like. A lot of people think they're like the Pharisee in Luke 18, verses 9 through 15. Went up to pray. You remember the story? Went up to pray. He prayed thus with himself, and the idea is like he's almost praying to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Extortioners, murderers, idolaters. Uh, I give. I fast. I do all these things, he says. Friend, you talk about a prideful and arrogant man. That was the man. He thought he was it religiously. He thought he was the next best thing God had, next to Jesus Christ, of course. But again, let's empty ourselves. When we get to thinking we're that way, let's realize we're no better than anybody else. We all stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. Some people, because of their financial status, they sometimes think they're better, better than other people. And friend, money doesn't make you any better than anybody else. You can find people in the Bible who had a lot of money, who did good, and you can find people in the Bible who had very little money and did good as well. In fact, with riches, sometimes there's more temptation to go along with that. But money, money doesn't make you any better than anybody else, or the lack of money doesn't make you any worse than anybody else. We need to empty of ourselves of thinking that, hey, he's got a lot of money, he's powerful, he's really good. What about the poor widow and her two talents? Jesus said she gave more than everybody else because she gave out of her poverty. Money is not going to make us that way. Professional status is not going to make us that way. Education is not going to make you that way. We need to empty ourselves of anything we think that makes us better than other people, and we need to have the attitude, I'm just here to serve and to please God. We, we need to empty ourselves not only of pride, but of selfishness. You ever known somebody who was too selfish to help the needy? James 1.27 says that's what real religion is all about. Pure, undefiled religion before God the Father is this. To visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction. Keep oneself unspotted from the world. You ever know anybody that's too good to get down and help those who are poor, sick, go help the homeless? Friend, that's selfishness. Sometimes we're too selfish to help our brethren. Galatians 6.10 says we're to do good unto all men, especially, listen to the emphasis, especially those of the household of faith. What about helping those inside the church who are in need, who are hurting, who are sick, who are tormented? We need to get down on their level and help them. Sometimes, though, we're too selfish to even help the lost. We believe the gospel saves, Romans 1.16. We believe Jesus called us to spread the gospel, but I just don't have time. You mean your watch don't have 60 seconds in a minute and 24 hours in a day? Well, I just don't have time. Is it a matter of time, really, or is it a matter of priorities? And so we've got to empty ourselves of pride and of selfishness if we're going to be like the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And ultimately, if I'm going to have the mind of Christ, I've got to have a servant attitude. I'm here to serve. 
I'm not here to be served. I'm here to serve. That's the mindset. Look and, listen again. Uh, look in your Bible again at Philippians 2, verse number 7. Paul said of Jesus, he made himself of no reputation. What did he do? Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You see, a bondservant is unique in that he would do whatever possible for the master. He would even give his life for the master. Friend, I need to realize I'm a bond servant for the master, the Lord and Savior. I am not in charge. I'm not the boss. I'm not in control. I'm not the one who gets to sit around and tell everybody else what to do. Jesus is the master. If I'm a Christian, Jesus is the master, right? Acts 2 verse 36, I'm a bond servant of His. I'm a servant or slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.21, Paul said, For to me to live is Christ. There's the mindset of a bondservant. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 tells us that it's the love of Christ that motivates us to want to do that. And so a bondservant, his life is for the master. A, a, a bondservant is fully devoted to the master. Luke 9.23, Jesus said, If anybody desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Paul said, I die daily. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, and thus we've got to be faithful unto death. And so if I'm going to be a bondservant, I need to give my life to the master. I need to realize I've got to be devoted fully to the master and his work and his cause. A bondservant is also under the master's authority. Colossians 3, 17, Paul said, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. Friend, we need to realize that Christ is the master. I'm under his authority, meaning he gets to tell me what to do. I'm the one who is supposed to submit to him and his will. I don't make the rules. I just go by them. I have to follow the law. I don't make the laws. I'm under the law, and I have to follow that law, and I'll be judged by it. John 12, 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my will has that which judges him, the word that I've spoken, will judge him in the last day. And then, friend, a bondservant, that, and the attitude of a bondservant also is he loves the master deeply. Jesus said, If you love me, Keep my commandments. John 14, 15. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mark 12, verse, verse 30. Do, 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 do you love God? Do you really love the Master? If so, as a, be a bondservant and don't put yourself in your thinking as better than other people. That, that's where sometimes people look at Christians and they think, well, they, th they think they're better than everybody else. Hey, I need God's grace and mercy and love just as much as everybody else, and I'm a sinner in need of salvation just like everybody. I am not any better, and that's the attitude that we as Christians want to have. And then Paul says, to have the mind of Christ, we have to be willing to humble ourselves. He humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. How humbling do you think it was for Jesus? Is Jesus God? Sure He is. Was He God before? Sure. John 17, 3. Is He God? Absolutely. But imagine how humbling, how humiliating Jesus dying on the cross must have been. Paul portrays humility in two ways in this text. It is both obedience and it is also that Christians must be of the right mindset to do that. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient. Humility requires me to be obedient to God. The Bible teaches I must do that. Jesus said it's not everybody that looks up in heaven and says, Lord, Lord's going there, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so it's not enough just to say I believe in God. I also have to do what God says. And then there's that sacrifice involved in humility that we've been talking about. Don't think of yourself bigger. I, I, I'm too good to do this. No, that's not it. He humbled himself, became obedient, and followed through with the ultimate will of Almighty God. And friend, what we're trying to get across is, if I'm going to learn more about Jesus, what we're talking about in this series, and I'm going to have the mind of Christ, 
That'll solve so many problems if I can realize I've got to be selfless. I am only a bond servant, and I need to humble myself before the almighty throne of God, and God can exalt me up. You see, Paul closes this section in verses 9 through 11 by saying, Everyone who humbles himself be exalted. When we bow before the almighty knee of God, God will exalt us in due time. There's a day coming. When people are going to be exalted, put, put in high place, if we will. But it's God who does that after, not before, after a life of service to Almighty God. And so because of Christ's humility, He was exalted. One day, we can be given an exalted place as well. He's at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews 1 verse 3, and one day we can be in heaven with Him. There was a, a great recognition of who Jesus was, and, and when we make that, that great confession to follow Christ, I need to humble myself and live a selfless life each and every day in service to Him. And so friend, I want to ask you today, in a world that is filled with selfishness, where if something happens, people almost freak out if it somehow causes their day to be just a little off. I want us to think about who we really are. I'm a servant of God. I'm a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner in need of God's grace, and I need to realize I'm no better than anybody else. I, I need the attitude, the selfless mind of Christ that I look out not only for my own interest, but also for the interest of others and that I don't elevate myself above somebody else. And so today, we want to ask you, are you a follower of Christ? Friend, we want you to know that we're concerned about your soul. We want you to go to heaven more than anything. We want you to live a life of service to God. If you've never obeyed the gospel, why not do that? Why not live a life? that has real meaning and purpose beyond yourself to serve God and do something for Him and to serve others. You see, there's the two great commands. You love God, you love your neighbor as yourself. If we can do that, selflessness will phase out and the glory and majesty of God can be seen in our lives. We're so glad you joined us today. We hope that you'll join us next time in our study of more about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the